It's always good to have our children share in worship. And it's always uh, one of the things that what happens when we do things by rote and we do things so often, sometimes we don't look at what's happened currently because we think what we did last Sunday be the same thing we do this Sunday. And so we act that. We do that in life, don't we? And life is always changing. Uh, I came across uh, a job description for parents. It says, long-term team players needed for challenging permanent work in an often chaotic environment. Candidates must possess excellent communication and organizational skills and be willing to work variable hours, which includes evenings and weekends and 24-hour shifts on call. Some overnight travel required, including trips to primitive campsites on rainy weekends and endless sports tournaments in faraway cities. Travel expense not reimbursed. Responsibilities. Must provide on-site training and basic life skills such as nose blowing. Have strong skills in negotiating, conflict resolution, and crisis management. Must be able to think outside of the box, but do not lose track of the box because you most likely will need it for a school project. Must be able to choose your battles and stick to your guns. Must be able to withstand criticism such as, you don't know anything. Must be willing to be hated, at least temporarily, until someone needs $5 to go skating. <laughs> must be willing to bite tongue repeatedly. All must, also must possess the physical stamina of a pack mule and be able to go from zero to 60 miles per hour in three seconds flat in case this time the screams from the backyard are not from someone just crying wolf. Must be willing to face stimulating technical challenges such as small gadget repair, mysterious sluggish toilets, and stuck zippers. Must be willing to be indispensable one minute and an embarrassment the next. Must handle assembly and product safety testing of a half million cheap plastic toys and battery operated devices. Also must have a highly energetic entrepreneurial spirit because fundraiser will be your middle name. Must have a diverse knowledge base so as to answer questions such as, what makes the wind move? Must always hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. Must assume final, complete accountability for the quality of the end product. Responsible also includes floor maintenance and janitorial works and throughout the facility. Possibility for advancement and promotion, virtually none. Your job is to remain in the same position for years without complaining, constantly retaining and updating your skills so that those in your charge can ultimately surpass you. Previous experience. None required, unfortunately. Own the job training on a continually exhausting basis. Wages and compensation. You pay them, offering frequent raises and bonuses. A balloon payment is due when they turn 18 because of the assumption that college would help them become financially independent. And when you die, you give them whatever is left. The oddest thing about this reverse salary scheme is that you actually enjoy it and wish you could do it more. Benefits. While no health or dental insurance, no pension, no tuition, reimbursement, no paid holidays, and no stock options are offered, the job supplies limitless opportunities for personal growth and free hugs for life if you play your cards right. Well, that's a pretty exhausting list, isn't it? Parenting is one of the most challenging professions offered in this world. And we always have to remember that as we're going through the process of parenting, we don't have finished products until they start leaving home and are on their own and financially independent. It's always a job in process. Friday morning, I left early to go to Fort Bragg to attend Mitch Mason's graduation from a family uh, chaplain school 
on the post there, and as I was leaving and started driving, I was reflecting on what I had planned to share with you this morning, and the word I got was no. I said, Lord, don't do this to me. I, I just didn't feel at peace. I said, no, you need to go in another direction. I said, why? This is this dialogue. It's because you have a wealth of experience through these years and wisdom that I poured into your heart that you ought to share about parenting and grandparenting today. I said, but Lord, you know how busy my day is? Because I went to Fort Bragg, then I went to Charlotte to a preschool graduation of my grandson back home yesterday morning out to a gymnastic event for one of my granddaughters, and that lasted, and we got home at 4, and then 7 o'clock I'm with my grandson at his house, I mean, at school, because they had a senior showcase. And I said Friday, Lord, you know how busy I'm going to be? <laughs> and he said, well, you're going to be driving for four hours today. I'll give you some time to think. So that's what I've done. And, and so I looked at something like parenting with grace. What is the best wisdom to offer from all the experiences I've had in life? Jesus made this statement that's really challenging. He, he said, but if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's a pretty awesome statement, isn't it? Uh, it made me ponder, if anyone causes one of the little, little ones to sin, to miss the mark, to fall short, not to be what God created them to be, it would be better for that person, that parent, to be go ahead and put a millstone around his neck and throw him into the deepest sea. You know, I've met families and walked with families who have really felt like they're in the deepest part of the sea with their adult children because they strayed so far from their hopes and dreams. And then I start discovering, when I ask them about what they did along the way, there were some things they missed the mark. Parents, they didn't lead their child to what God had intended for them. You see, the primary reason parenting is a difficult job is that every human being is born into sin in this world by birth, by nature, by practice, by choice. And this is true of parents, and this is true of all children. Sin is at the root cause of all the problems we have in our world. It's that we fall short of God's intention. Sin is the root cause of parents and children lying to one another. Sin is at the root cause of husbands and wives cheating on one another. Sin is at the root cause of children rebelling against parent, parental authority. Uh, sin's at the root cause of parents losing their temper and degrading their children. Sin is the root cause of families hurting each other and refusing to forgive one another. And if the problem is sin, which is missing the mark, there's no other remedy for the problem of sin than Jesus Christ. That's why he came into the world, to remedy the sin problem. Thus, the greatest responsibility we have as parents and as a church is to lead them to Christ, for he is the remedy to sin. And from years of observing and walking with families, being a parent, a grandparent, going through the best and the worst of times of being with families in difficult situations. The most important thing, I think, for any parent, any grandparent attempt to do is this, is to pour the love of God, love and grace of God into my child's heart or my grandchild's heart. To pour it into the child's heart. Through the years, and now as an old man, that's hard to say, an old man. <laughs> I have found the wisdom of this to really be true. But seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I have found that statement to be so. If we really seek God and his righteousness, everything falls better into place. It just does. 
when a person has God at the center of his or her love relationship and his kingdom as a top priority, the person has a joyful balance in all of his or her life. It's interesting. God gave Moses a great command to give to his people when they're about ready to go into the promised land. Now I want to ask you, how many of you have this desire for your child? that you want them to grow up wise, loving, with respect and kindness, that they will be able to achieve and respect other people, that they will make wise choices that will not harm them, that will lead them down paths, ways that are destructive, that you want your child, when they get to adulthood, they're on the road to flourishing. Now, how many parents or grandparents want that for your children? I want that. How many of you would like for your child to be rebellious, to do his own thing, her own thing, run around, become sexually active at an early age, to become um, addicted to drugs or alcohol, to go through a fury of life of not being able to keep a job, to have anger problems. Anybody like to have a child like that? Well, I want to share what Moses said that may not prevent this, but is a sure guarantee that you're on the right track. And this is what he said, and God said to Moses, These are the commandments, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all my decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. And then he said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then he says, these commandments I give to you are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit up in the home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know what he was saying? If you love the Lord, you've got to teach that to your children. You've got to demonstrate that to your children. You've got to teach his word to the children. You just have to do this. See, the, the main place for a child to learn to love the Lord is the church. That's false. It's the home. It's a top priority over school, over dance lessons, over recreational pursuits, over soccer or basketball, over school activity. It's to attempt to pour the love of God into your child's heart. And the reason is, maybe, maybe one of your children will become a superstar. The chances of that are unlikely. But we're all going to grow up and live into a world where God wants us to be productive and joyful and happy and to have life. And so God is around forever. A lot of these activities are just temporary things, and they're good things. The proverb says it well, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. This verse has a great promise, and it has a, a great... Uh, challenge. And unfortunately, most of us don't know what this verse means. N note the word train. Train implies a constant action. Anybody here run a marathon? Half marathon? 5K? You done any of that? D do you just go out and run it, or do you train for it? it how have you learned to use a computer? You just have to keep at it, don't you? You're training yourself. Training has this implication 
that you point a child in a direction he should go. Train him in the way he should go, which means according to the child's unique personality. Sometimes we try to change a child train a child according to what we want and not who that child is. And children have different learning methods, they have different personalities, they receive and respond to information differently. What is the unique bent that God has given to that child? And then it's to train that child accordingly. Our daughter was uh, a challenge growing up. Uh, because she had a personality that serves her very well today in her profession as a leader. Uh, and her personality I discovered in the 11th grade. I wish I'd known it in the 5th grade. It, it's called, a, it, one thing's called, a, it, it's a high D, which means she likes to be in charge. She like, but we, and, and when we demanded her to do something, all she could hear was, you want to fight? But when we start putting boundaries and say you have to get this done by a certain time and she had to do that, it became so much easier because of her personality. Now, as a leader of two medical practices, it's doing well for her to manage, you know, 30 people and manage them well and give them direction to keep the business on task. Learning the child's personality. We often said if we just had one child, we'd have been perfect parents. Because our oldest son was very compliant, easygoing, which a lot of first children are. But the second child is entirely different. So you've got to train them. Uh, how many times through the years, sitting with parents in tough or tragic or grievous times or difficult times, I brought my child to church. We went when the doors were open. Listen, just bringing your child to church is no guarantee that they will be trained in the way of the Lord. All we can do is assist to help you. Today, at best, a child has one to three hours they may be at church. So that means there's 161, 160, I mean 300, no, 161, 162 hours a week that they're somewhere else. And you have to ask, who is training your children? Well, who's having a greater influence on them? You know, is it the school? Is it their peer group? Is it the TV programs they watch? Is it the games they play? Who is having the influence upon them? And what, somewhere along the way, we got the, I've taken them to church, which is a good thing because that gives a focus, but all we could do is assist you in the responsibilities you have. On the flap of George Barner's book called Transforming Children as Spiritual Champions, he has this. Parental advisory. The enemy has plans for your children. Do you? You see, we live with an enemy in the world that wants to lead our, uh, our families and our children down roads of pain and destruction where we're not serving God and we come incomplete. He is real. And if you don't know that, then you, you, you've succumbed to it. There is a lot of evil in our world. And the enemy has plans for your children, but do you have plans? Uh, to, to pour the love of God into your child's heart is deliberate, planned, daily discipline. And here's why this is important. In this book, Barner's research on um, uh, children in America indicates by the age of nine, most children have their moral values in place. In other words, they have the framework in which they are going to interpret the world morally. Those things are in place. By the age of 13, they'll have the framework about what they believe about God into place. His research reveals the probability of a child coming to accept Jesus as their Savior from 5 to 13 is a 32% probability. By the time they are children, 14 to 18, there's a 4% probability of a child accepting Christ. And from 19 until death, it's only a 6% probability of a child coming to Christ. Now I want to ask you something. Looking at those statistics, is ministry to children and their families important? 
the most important ministry any church has is to assist families in helping them get connected to God and Christ and their children to Christ. It is the most important ministry we have. And I thought if I had the privilege of parenting again, what would I do again? Well, here's some things I think I would do again. Develop my child's heart and conscience. Develop my child's heart and conscience. Uh, it's going to be developed. Jesus said, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, his mouth speaks. So I want to shepherd my child or my grandchild's heart to understand what's in that heart, to develop a conscience uh, of where there can be an inner moral compass to guide them, to help, help my child to understand guilt and distinguish between what is true guilt and what is false guilt and develop some biblical steps to deal with guilt, to know the forgiveness of God and the love of God that comes through the confession and the ownership of the things that bring us guilt. And what we've done in our day, in our world, is we, over, we put this down. We don't, nobody's at fault anymore. It's always somebody else. But we're teaching individual responsibility. The second thing would be is the Bible would be the most read book in my home. You hear that? The most read book in my home. Proverbs 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I mean, this is important. Somewhere we get our guidance in the Bible. It's like God puts commands and decrees and guidance out. There'd be like guardrails on a, on a highway to keep you in the highway so you won't have an accident in life, so you won't go astray. He's, he put them there because he loves us. Say, so you do it this way and you're going to have life. But do your children learn this at home do you talk about what they're learning in the home do you seek to apply ways to, to, to truth this during the week my grandson drove me here this morning so I could reflect on this and I, as I was going through this one I said what is one of the biggest things that's helped you he said having spiritual discussions during the week in the home Talking about life from a spiritual perspective, bringing the Bible to life has been a big help. There are five verses that I would want my children to know. I would want them to know John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more to the full. The idea that Jesus comes to give us life, abundant life, meaningful life, purposeful life, but there is a force out there that wants to steal and destroy. It may be fun for a season, but it'll end up in death. I would want him to know John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I would want him to focus on that word believes because today is we could believe something and it have no effect on our lives. Isn't that true? Oh, that's true, but you go and live your own way. The idea here in the Bible, believes means I am following the way of Christ. For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I want them to know Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I would focus on that term wages. Wages becomes what you earn for doing something. If a person keeps taking drugs, the wages of that is going to be death. If the person abuses alcohol and continues doing it, the continual wages is going to lead to death. There are, there are relationships to death. If I keep being mean and self-centered and I keep doing that, the wages of that are going to be death in relationships. I would want them to know uh, that that is but God wants to give us life I'd want them to know Jeremiah 29 11 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I would want them to know the God who created you loves you enough to give you a plan for life. He really does that. If you want that plan, how do you discover it? Well, you've got to seek him. You've got to follow after him. His plan is a good and perfect plan. I would want him to know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Think about it. If you're trusting God and you're not leaning to your own understanding, you've got those moral guidelines around you from the scripture, you acknowledge him and he's going to direct your path in a straight way. But if you ignore them, you're apt to go off course. I would teach my child to be rightly related to money. One of the biggest problems in human relationships and family today is people do not manage their money well. The average household has an indebtedness just on credit cards between twelve to $25,000. That means they have bought into their future life this amount of money because they didn't know how to manage and their, their wanters got out of what their needs were. First Timothy says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Over the years, I've been with many people who struggle financially. I want you to know, I really don't know what it's like to be confronted with huge indebtedness. There are a lot of things in life I've never had that I wanted. But before I got married, I was wondering, I'm going back to school, Joyce is teaching, how in the world are we going to make it? And Joyce's father said one simple thing. He said, if you can't afford a color television, don't buy it. If you can't afford it, and what's happened in our world, everything you look at is trying to induce us to think we're going to be happier if we buy something, and it's going to bring that immediate gratification. So we mortgage our future to get something we want now, and we get in this roving cycle of debt because something else is going to come down the road to require more expenses. So after our first Christmas, I charged four, three different places for Christmas presents for Joyce, and it took three months to pay it off, and I paid a whopping $9 in interest. And I said, I am never going to do that again. And I haven't. You know, this management of money, and, and I think it comes when God is first. If he is first and we teach him, and you know, we started tithing as a young couple when we came to this church. Forty-eight years later, we have been able to give way beyond that, and, and God has provided through all kinds of ways, sometimes miraculous, everything we ever needed, not everything we wanted. And now at this age, I'm grateful for that principle. I had a friend who, he put three jars on his children's chest of drawers, and he and he said, on this jar, I want you to put 10% for giving to the Lord. I want you to save at least 10%, and whatever you put in this jar, you can spend any time you want to. And they learned the, the, the thing of delayed gratification of accumulating money, but more important, they learned that God was first. See, when God is first, things tend to fall better in place. I will want to teach my children to be kind and serve one another. I'd want them to know this verse. Whatever you do, work at with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Children are naturally self-centered. Isn't that true? They're naturally self-centered, always wanting things done for them. But if we don't teach them to want and to serve other people, they're going to be in this mode, always expecting somebody to give them what they want. And what happens, we live in a life of dependency and mi misery. So we need to have opportunities to go on mission trips with them, to serve in our community, to serve a neighbor, to wait on people. 
And, and it's important that we lead by example. The most important thing I want to do is to learn to pray without ceasing. You see, prayer is a personal relationship with God. And it's, uh, it brings God into daily living. It, it brings, opens us up to the resources of God. In James 1, 5 we read, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Wisdom is the ability to apply truth in life. And James tells us, if you ask God, He's going to give you that. You have that relationship with Him, He's going to make it happen. Uh, and James 4, 2 says, you have not because you do not ask God. One of the greatest things I've personally learned in life, and it's taken me a while to get there, I learned to talk with God throughout the day because he abundantly wants to guide us. And sometimes we come to church on Sunday and we have no relationship with God until we get in a pinch. And then we cry out to God and we wonder where he is. But if we don't know him through our daily relationship, it's going to be hard to hear him in the pinch. Do you understand that? The greatest thing we can teach our child and for us to do is to learn to pray without ceasing. Because then we get to know who God is. Our eyes are open. We begin to experience the wonder of this God who is alive in this world. And the thing that grieves me the most is that too many of us who come to church know about God, but we don't know how to live with Him. And we ignore Him. And I believe, as Paul prayed in Ephesians, he is abundantly able to do immeasurably more than we ever dreamed possible if we but walk with him. Parents, grandparents, what are you doing in the way of guiding your children in the way they should go? May God help us because I know all of us want the very best for our children. And the best that I've ever seen comes from parents who, who tempt their best to nurture the children in the way of the Lord. And the best of what a church can be is when we come alongside and help parents and children get connected to the Lord. And, and there's a greater probability in doing that their life is going to be happier. Sometimes doesn't work that way no matter how hard you have tried sometimes kids make bad choices but what we have is we have a world shouting at us a way to live that's wrong and we got to say who we're we going to listen to the world or to the God who created us in the womb the God who has a plan for us the God who wants to give us a hope and a future, the God who in Christ said, I want to come and love you through your weaknesses and your failures and, and when you sin and go astray to restore you and to give you life, life everlasting. The choice is ours. Let's pray together. Father, as parents, we all struggle to but we all have the same desire. We want the very best for our children. Sometimes we don't know how to get there because we haven't given a whole lot of thought to it or a lot of guidance. Maybe our homes were not the best, and we are just repeating what we saw. Maybe it's because, Father, we listen too much to the world and, and we, we forget that, that you call us to a great task and that a child is a precious gift and to be held and to love, to be forgiven and to be molded and to direct it. Lord, sometimes we're just so selfish in doing what we want to do, we feel like we'd be embarrassed coming to church. Uh, we just make that unimportant. And Lord, I know the devil's one a day then. I would pray, Father, that more and more in this community that you would give us Christian homes. 
Help us to learn to love and grow together and encourage one another and come alongside each other as we nurture our children and our grandchildren. Help us to seek you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.